welcome to Varn Blog. And today I'm here with Jeremy Gross, a cybernetic Jewish socialist who is interested in everything from advanced mathematics, which you were trained in, to uh, the legacy and history of Freemasonry. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're focusing on some of your work in cybernetics. And since, since Red Plenty came out about a decade ago, in a few odd years ago, um, there's been a lot of discussion of Soviet and post-Soviet cybernetics. It's led to a significant reinvestigation of the CyberSim project. Now, I'm on record in saying that uh, the Cordona system actually worked on cybernetic principles, even if CyberSim really never got proven <laughs> one way or the other. Um, but there's a lot more to that. Um, and it's kind of gone in two different directions. There's the, there's this uh, um, econophysis branch that you see with uh, Cockshot and Cottrell's Towards the New Socialism. And then there's a kind of separate version that's, that comes in anarchist adjacent circles that people like uh, General Intellect Unit, the podcast, have explored um, that use cybernetic inputs to get around the idea of um, central bureaucracy being necessary for any kind of planning. Um, You wrote an article for Red Reg and subsequently revised and published it on your site, and I'll include it in the... um, in the show notes, but it's the basis for our discussion today. And one of the, the things I wanted to ask you about is why is it that a bunch of management consultants uh, took up a branch of Soviet research abandoned by the Soviets themselves and used it pretty successfully in business and then tried to help other socialists uh, with it later. So how did that happen? What's the story there? So I mean, uh, cybernetics is an interdisciplinary science. Um, it always was wildly interdisciplinary to the extent that it never really cohered into a particular science. It really was a room full of people trying to come up with shared metaphors for very, very different things. So there were a series of conferences in the late 40s, the the Macy conferences, in which they really tried to pin down what is the science of cybernetics. And a lot of the people in that first generation, for the rest of their lives and careers, clung to the idea that there was a coherent thing called cybernetics, but none of them could agree what it was. And... um, at some point, the various components sort of unraveled and went their own separate ways. And it's a bit of a shame because I think, you know, you could think of, you know, even though they insisted that cybernetics was a science, in a sense, it's more of a Wissenschaft in a way. You know what I mean? It's something vaguer than a science, but still worthy of lumping together. So... Some of the people came, a lot of them came out of the military Mm. and um, had these different sorts of problems. These problems were appearing in evolutionary biology. They were appearing in neuroanatomy. They were definitely appearing in weapons guidance systems and problems of mass scale logistics and... So a bunch of people who were working on these very, very city planning was another one. People working in these very, very different systems got together for a bunch of conferences. They did a lot of very intense networking with each other. And to the extent they were passionate about sharing ideas with each other, cybernetics cohered. Um, And it really created different schools of cybernetics in different countries, uh, even though I would say there's a unified cybernetics that everybody involved in cybernetics was involved with, it really emerged in very different paths in different countries. Right. I mean, I, I think about, uh, 
I know a lot more about the Norbert Wiener Stanford Beer schools, and I know a lot about the Soviet um, schools, which, which depending on how you count, go back to um, different things the Soviets were playing around with as early as the the twenties, if you count uh, Bogdanov's research sure. part of it. Um, but. It also reminds me, cybernetic theory, which I think now, unfortunately, because of pop culture and because of cybernetics crucialness to DARPA developing the ARPANET um, and thus the Internet, we, we tend to think of cybernetics as a as a digital end of computer science kind of adjacent to robotics and as i've liked to remind people that that's not what anybody meant in the mid 20th century by it no. um and i also think you know the closest things we have that are parallel to it are like general systems theory our complexity theory which are also kind of you know, Weisenschaft gestalt ideas more than concrete scientist sciences, although there are people that will tell you that these things are sciences. But when you ask someone to define what complexity theory is or systems theory, you get a bunch of definitions that are non overlapping. <laughs> so, sure. sure. Um, and in fact, I have a hard time telling where systems theory begins and ends and where cybernetics begins and ends, to be honest. Um, sure. And I professionally work in uh, machine learning AI mm -hmm. and the amount of bullshit about those things is just piled so high that uh, I think, you know, a lot of people can train a machine learning model to work, but I think the term artificial intelligence is incredibly problematic. And, you know, it's a it's a marketing term, I would say, you know. Yeah, I mean, not even to get into like the classical analytics discussions about the Chinese box problem. Um, <laughs> but as as I've told people, most of these artificial intelligences are pattern seeking. And the reason why you get kinds of random answers from them sometimes or wild stuff or they can't do certain things, is partly because they're they're combining inputs in a somewhat linear way like in it is garbage in garbage out um but you can also have great things in garbage out like you know i i work in healthcare it i my clients are all hospitals insurance companies that kind of thing and it's i'll give you an example we had a um a model where we were trying to figure out ways that diabetic patients could uh, be readmitted to the hospital less often. There's a metric that hospitals use where if a diabetic patient ends up in the hospital and then ends up in the hospital within 30 days, the hospital screwed up somehow. And that's a measurable thing that's used as a metric for the care of diabetic patients in hospitals. So we had this... Uh, model that we were working on for the, one of my clients where we were trying to determine what we could do to stop readmissions. And it turned out that in terms of machine learning, the feature that was most dominant is what's called the discharge disposition, which is what the doctor says is the reason they got out of the hospital. And that a lot, I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of features fed into the model, but one of them is discharge disposition. It turned out to rank pretty high. So we were diving into it, and there were a couple discharge dispositions that meant this person was never going to be readmitted to the hospital, and they all clustered around being sent to hospice. Now, that's not a better outcome. <laughs> you know what I mean? So people were like, well, you know, if you just had a machine learning robot that didn't have a person, you'd be like, wow, we really don't want people to go back to the hospital who have diabetes. Let's just send them all to hospice. You know, but that's not a good outcome. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I've been really studying stuff like the use of, quote, intelligent systems analysis with police officers and uh, crime where, oh, my God, the junk science. And that junk science is kind of all over the place. 
Um, one thing that I find really worrying about it is I've gotten like uh, some of the anthropology training packs that they've used um, that they still train with. And they're from the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Like they still talk about like three races and everyone's an ab like if you get certain kinds of hair, it's an admixture of race. And I'm like, this is wild that this is still being used. And so when I see that and then I go in and and think about what they might be doing with with these uh, machine learning algorithms, I get really afraid because <laughs> I'm just like, oh, God, like. Yeah, and it's worse than that because if you come up with a very good model that doesn't conform to the dictates of capitalism, it just gets thrown out. So, you know, if you're solving for maximizing profit, that's great. But if you're solving for something else and as a result, profits go down, a lot of people are just simply not interested or they'll just say it's a bad model. Hmm. Um. Are you familiar with the work of uh, Dwayne Monroe? He's been on the show uh, before. He's uh, a, 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 a Marxist tech analyst, and uh, he works in cloud architecture. And he tells me that, you know, A, the cloud is, you, we need to quit thinking of it as a cloud. It's a bunch of physical machines mm. um, that have high resource needs and are in precarious areas, and there's all kinds of physical infrastructure around. Um and B, when you combine that with talks about AI inputs, what you get is these highly complex uh, models that that really don't do what oh, they're sold as doing. I mean, the, the there are there are ones that are interesting. Like I'm interested in in like the whole recent scuffle about chatbot, but I'm actually surprised it's taken this long to get something like a chatbot. Not because chatbots particularly, I mean, it, it's Google with, with, with better syntax um, filters. But uh, what has surprised me about it is like, it, and yeah, it can mimic certain things sometimes. It's actually interesting what it can and cannot mimic. So, sure. Um, if you ask it to write something in the style of a journalist who does very particular things, it can, it can do that because those obsessions are obvious that that vocabulary is simple and common and it can spit it out. But you, if you ask it, for example, to write a poem in the style of Nick cave, it really can't figure out what it's doing. There's just subtle cues that it can't do. Um, now as a high school teacher, uh, I, I I think we over rely on writing sometimes anyway, although it is a good proxy for getting people to clarify their thinking, the syntax. You I've been a high school teacher too. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. But but uh chatbot will chatbot can do better than about 90% of my students. Um but I'm not worried about it doing very complicated things are actually quote thinking. Um, and while it, it will be a profit maximizer in the sense that it, re it removes a whole lot of tedious work in the same way that like grammar checks did. Um, it probably won't do like that much other than get rid of a lot of small redundant, um, human based like marketing stuff that's been really driven into rote uh performance anyway i mean well, so you know i i think in tech mm -hmm. tech doesn't care about solutions tech cares about investors so if mm -hmm. you promise that you are going to deliver a solution you'll get investors it doesn't matter if you solve that problem or not. If you can obfuscate it with enough bullshit, you can sell it. I mean, that's basically the whole story of crypto. You know, it's like get people very excited about something they don't fully understand and get tons and tons of investors. It's always going to be about the investors in this in this economic system than it is about actually solving anything. I think you could probably 
AI probably has a lifespan of like 10 or 15 years where it solves things in a very mediocre way, but the hype is there. You know, I'll give you an example, like customer service. Um, it used to be that you had two kinds of companies, companies that absolutely didn't give a shit about customer service and didn't bother with it. And ones that really banked their brand on customer service and provided outstanding customer service. And what has happened in, I, mean, I hate to use the term under neoliberalism, but you'll know what I mean as a shorthand if I say that. We're, um, customer service is a net loss. So they, companies don't want to spend on customer service, but they do need some amount of customer service. So we've seen uh, customer service call centers go to English speaking regions of the global South or parts of the U S South where labor laws are terrible. And even used to still, work in one of those. <laughs> yeah. It, even still they're shaving it down further and further and further. Cause it's not something they want to spend money on, but they need for their systems to function. Enter chatbots. enter, you know, vocal chat bots. You know, if, if, Amazon could replace Amazon customer service with vocal chatbots that don't really work, but work just enough to keep things going. They would be perfectly delighted to do that. And they I, pretty much have, honestly, yeah. like, like I, tr having had to like get in touch with someone at an airline, for example, um, that is hours and hours of navigating chat bots and figuring out the right way to trip it to make it to force you over to a person because the chat bot usually can't actually fix your problem. Right. Um, but they're going to tie you up in that. And in a lot of places, the only customer service line you can call is a chat bot line. Yeah. And um, the, the goal is to get you off the phone. Mm -hmm. And if they get you off the phone because you're so frustrated, that's fine. And they don't really want to waste capital or they don't want to waste money paying somebody to be on the phone with you. So turning that over to either a textual or a vocal chat bot is fine. They can just, you know, change so instead of somebody's wage, they just have a computer spinning in the darkness, you know. And unfortunately, I mean, to tie it back into original stuff, this kind of use of, of machine learning is what a lot of people think cybernetics is. And yeah. while cybernetics is part of machine learning, um, even the, the capitalist versions of this early on, the definitely pre-neoliberal, were not aimed at this kind of active inefficiency info solution and, and also rent seeking i mean interestingly enough i don't think i've ever talked about this on air uh, i'm a believer of labor theory of value in a very loose sense not in the exact way that marxists do but i still believe it uh, well the way marxists believed it in the 19th century i think um that actually is unclear in marx in some ways but but the reason why is i work in education and i've seen what is and is not profitable and what and what generates profits and the two things that i can tell you that don't generate profits it's is super high labor investment or total automation either one of those things uh are not are not profitable i mean um, mark, mark spelled this out a long time ago that if it's if labor is cheap you hire people if labor is expensive, you figure out ways to automate, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a sort of crude way of putting it, but there is that sort of slider going on where the price of labor determines the level of automation. And as you chase labor further and further away from the capitalist center, you're going to reach a point where automation is really going to be much more attractive than paying people even in... You know, Bangladesh as a work center, for example, you know, or Vietnam or other places. Right. Um, I find that important to understand when I explain to people that the United States is still the second most industrially productive economy on the planet. And they're like, we don't make anything here. I'm like, no, no, you don't make anything <laughs> here. We make stuff with robots and about 400 people in a factory that used to be like seven or eight thousand like yeah. 
it requires a person and the and and I get really technical and marciological arguments about what technology is doing because we can get into the debates about technology adding value, which I think is beside the point. Mm -hmm. But what it really does is increase workers' efficiency by reducing nece socially necessary labor time. Um, yeah, most coal mines are are run by ten or less people. Right. I mean, you just you don't if if the socially necessary labor time for people, you just get it down to as small as you possibly can, mm -hmm. and you're also getting so much efficiency per person that in most times, although not currently, it leads to uh, labor supply in, uh, in elasticity. So there's more, pe there's more people in the labor market than, uh, uh, than can be absorbed uh, by any one job. And that's, that's optimal conditions for suppressing wages, et cetera. Um, and, you know, and this stuff, I was like, yeah, Marx really worked a lot of this out, like before automation was what anything like what we think about it today, when you're still in very crude mechanical industrial automation, not the kind of super sophisticated stuff we have now. Yeah. Um, but it's a real shame that, that cybernetics has been associated with that um, because... What you also get from cybernetics, and I admit there's some stuff we don't know. So, for example, um, one of my hesitations when everybody starts thinking about cybernetics as this big computer planning machine. And I'm like, yeah, but there's an energy sink to cleaning up data. Like, there is, and it's a problem. Um, and it would be a problem under socialism, too. We might figure out, but we have way more incentives to do it. I mean, if you think about... I like thinking about uh, the Internet 1.5 versus the Internet now. And the Internet 1.5 was very poorly monetized, just in general. No one can make money off of it. Um, a whole lot of it was open source stuff. Uh, the, the initial patents when released to the public uh, for the World Wide Web were just given out, which, thank God they were, because if they weren't, we would have never gotten the Internet. Yeah, sure. Um, but... Now, since about 2008, since the 2.0ization, everything's been monetized and their function. At first, it becomes inconvenient. And then functionality just starts to fall apart. I've been noticing this with, with like Google searches, for example. Google searches uh, have become less and less functional because you get a higher proportion of ads. And um, Google is increasingly trying to not not just predict what you want, but set up what you want for you based on a profile it is generating, which actually means using it to find certain kinds of information, even sometimes when you know that information exists and you have a rough idea where it's at, it's harder and harder to access unless you know the exact URL protocol. And now that there's so much on the internet, that's harder and harder to just remember. Yeah. So it's it becomes a very, very, very kind of kluge search engine in a way that the search engines that replaced in the 90s kind of were, maybe even some ways worse. Um, similarly, uh, I don't know about you, we're both kind of older, um, so we still get on the face of book sometimes, but I find Facebook to be so kluge that it, parts of it are unoperational at any sure. given time. Like, sure. And it's just not concerned about it. Like it's not concerned about its product being incoherent and not really working or only working in certain weird ways. Um, I'm in fact, I've even been told by some people that there's some evidence that it allows the kluginess to exist partly to increase time spent on the site to expose you to more advertising, because if it's not working optimally, you're kind of stuck there. Sure. Uh, and Amazon uh, is that way too, where, you know, I think the UI and art design of Amazon is incredibly ugly. And it's, you know, I'll have times, I, I have a lot of weird interests and I'll hunt down a book and I'll search for it and I won't be able to find it. And then I will try a whole bunch of schemes and it'll show up on the seventh or eighth trick I did when I, all I had should have had to do is just type the author's name. Yeah. You know, I've, I've definitely seen that. Like, in fact, recently I was looking for some Baudrillard books and I was <laughs> like, okay, where's it at? Like, I know you sell this. Like, I, 
I know one of your subsidiary sells it somewhere. And you can also see in like personalized recommendations, when you first get on Pandora or Spotify or Amazon, these things that were good at personalized recommendations uh, five, six, ten years ago, um, now they're really shit at it. Yeah, like, yeah, they, they, they don't know how to personalize for you anymore, despite the fact theoretically they have a better profile. I'm not even going to get on to what I've discovered messing around with TikTok because <laughs> TikTok can't figure out my ethnicity. And so I have a couple of different profiles where it thinks I'm different ethnicities based on what I liked. Yeah. And I get as, completely different things. As so. a Jewish scholar, this stuff gets nightmarish. Like, you know, I, you know, something as stupid as a YouTube algorithm, I'll watch a couple of videos that are in Yiddish about Yiddish socialism at the turn of the last century. And it'll say, oh, you're watching religious videos. You may want to watch this uh, mega church sermon from an evangelical church and you know it's uh, it's nightmarish it's like oh you're very very interested in jewish stuff you might like christianity <laughs> you know yeah it actually that that is is fascinating because i i think that was kind of exposed a little bit during the whole alt-right stuff when like mm. my some of my videos um not my personal videos videos i was on i would see it trip off right wing stuff because it would just be like oh you mentioned this you must be interested and and facebook is even more nasty about it where i will write posts about the talmud and some observation and then i will get bombarded with christian nationalist ads for days and days and days because i wrote something religious and the algorithm says oh religious this is what is religious and oh, I can't yeah. get it off. I can't. I just get flooded with Christian nationalist ads for days and days and days. And the only solution I have is just not post for a couple of days. And then it goes away. Yeah, I was actually talking to somebody literally today. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, a Muslim friend of mine at TIR. Mm. Uh, and he, he likes something probably religious. And it got him into... Andrew Tay, Jordan Peterson, Spear for like a yeah. couple of weeks. And he was like, it's so disgusting and so much worse than I thought. And I'm like, I don't see that stuff because I have not accidentally <laughs> uh, tapped something adjacent to it, except for once. And I did once. I was looking at stuff for like men's fashion. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, for a couple of days, it was throwing out this this really Jordan Peterson -y stuff. And I just kept, you know, yeah. trying to yeah. teach the algorithm that I didn't want it. But yeah. Or it'll just do religious settler Zionism um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. from occupied territories, and I'll just get flooded with that for days too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get I'll get that too. Not that that for sure. Um, and as a person who's, I it's interesting because I I am interested in general religious studies. This is something that you and I share. Sure. Um, and uh, I come from a a similar but not quite as Jewishy background, um, but you can't figure me out because mm -hmm. I've uh, I'm also interested in like religious studies in general. So again, it'll give me all kinds of stuff, or it'll confuse when I'm interested in a like Orthodox Christian historical text with me wanting like a whole bunch of like conservative religious uh, ads. Um, it's 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 actually kind of funny. Yeah. There's um, a line that James Joyce is where he, he's talking about why he th called himself an anarchist. He's like arguing with people like Pound and Elliot and stuff. And he says, I'm an anarchist because the state is concentric, but the individual is eccentric. And I think now we can say that like capitalism is concentric and the individual is eccentric. These, these algorithmic processes are trying to create these concentric forces in a world where people themselves are deeply weird and have lots of different interests. Yeah. I, I would say um, I had a friend of mine who works in the advertising end of tech. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I kind of consider her my insight into the dark overlord <laughs> world. Um, but she was, she was really worried about it because she's a, she's a person of color. Um, and she's noticed that, 
and moving from personalization to to immersion, there's been a uh, a shift in these algorithms to try to not try to personalize what you what you want, but to try to emerge you into what they think you want based off of very broad age, race, religious, and ethnic stereotyping. Sure. And she's she's been talking about it. We also talked about you know historical the compilations of this and how mathematically it works. Uh, I I got first interested in this in the math many many years ago. Um, I'm a poet by profession, and my backgrounds in science or anthropology. I I played with math like this in college <laughs> um, until I got into statistics, and then I worked at uh, said uh, said unnamed insurance big box center in the call center, and then we got moved to accounts receivable auditing. But one thing I was really interested in because I worked with a bunch of Morehouse grads who. Um, were weirdly apathetic about the fact that I kept on pointing out that our actual rare tables were racist without any race categories being considered um, because there were all these feedback loops in from uh, immediate legal stuff. So if there's a lot of arrest in the area, if there's a lot of, if there's a lot of accidents, if there's a lot of cop activity that gets factored into the actuarial tables. So I'm like, I'm like, so you guys are like doing anti-racist work on the back end on hiring, but it has no effect at all on the fact that we charge more um, for people who live in communities of color. And that and then, you know, this is actually leading up to the subprime crisis this is about two years before uh, before that started unravel in 2005, 2006. And then and then it really unraveled in 2007. But I was like looking at that and i was like oh the mortgages are this way too and i'm like some of this is knowingly racist but a lot of it isn't a lot of it is built into these mathematical algorithms because they're in the feedback loop like sure, sure. like that's that's how this is working and again it got me really interested in cybernetics because cybernetics for me i was increasingly associating with this dypo this dystopian nightmare that could end up to a very class hated and race hating world that that was not run by racist at all why like... well, yeah i mean once you build a machine you let it run it's just going to keep doing you know capitalism is a machine that was built with staggering amounts of structural racism and we're at a point now where structural racism is taboo to point out but individual racism is taboo to perform so you have these situations where capitalism, if it turns out that a situation is very, very, very racist, but there's no racist to point out, capitalism is perfectly happy with that. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the things that I that I've pointed out increasingly lately. Um, and I know I sound like Adolf Reed to some people, and since I'm white, that's probably suspect, but. Um, um, although I'm a white ethnic, I guess, <laughs> um, the, the, the way in which you see a lot of this work is we have increasing diversity in our media selection. You have increasing diversity, even in things like, like the board of Harvard's fairly diverse. And I know people, you know, go look it up. It really is. Mm -hmm. Um, and yet there's been no effect whatsoever on relative poverty for impoverished people of color, particularly black and indigenous. Um, and I keep on pointing out that like, well, that means that a lot of our cultural fixes don't matter. They're not important. And I got really worried when in critical race theory, and I, I will be one of the people who, you know, I have all my criticisms of CRT and I, and I really, have no patience for someone like Robin D'Angelo, but I actually like some of Abraham S. Kendi's work. But when he started talking about collapsing systemic bias, um, systemic racism, which I think is different, implicit bias and bigotry back into one concept as general racism, I'm like, no, no, that's going to confuse people. I know, I know the different words are confusing, mm -hmm. but like how you fix them is different, like fundamentally different. And 
the one that should actually probably scare us is not the one that we're generally focused on. And also, if you fix other broad scale systemic problems, such as just tackling poverty in general, um, educational access in general, returning standards to schools, etc., cetera, um, you would actually fix a lot of the more pernicious parts of structural racism without triggering a lot of backlash. Like, so it seems like, you know, even though a lot of the scholarship in that world is, some of it's actually quite good. I make use of it. Um, I tell people to go read uh, Every Habit's Kindy Stamp from the beginning all the time. But, but the, that element of it really worries me because it's not dealing with a lot of the most pernicious stuff at all. And, you know, relative levels of black poverty, even with increasing access to higher education and stuff have remained largely unchanged since the 2007 recession. And if you, if you look real back, it's been as bad as it's been all the way back into like the fifties. So that's, that in general is something to think about now. To flip it back to like the positive inner cybernetics, we have stuff in this cybernetic theory that would give us hints. I'm not saying what none of us is going to, you know, the, again, cybernetics also like machine learning is as good as your teleological orientation and the inputs. Yeah. Um, but that we could do something with this stuff and empower, empower people. Because the other thing that we have right now, I, I, I actually, before we get to the Stanford beer and the positive sure. stuff is an insane level of oligarchic and bureaucratic capture that like, despite all the stuff about capitalism that I was told as a kid that it fights against that I've not seen a society with the levels of bureaucracy and oligarchy that, that we currently have in the Western world. Like, ever it just hasn't existed in the past like there's yeah, nothing I mean, like the, it the, <laughs> you know there was uh you know in the 1940s right at the end of world war ii there was a vocal concern i mean i guess it was sort of embodied in the progressive party but there was a vocal concern of we've built this amazing bureaucratic apparatus to fight world war ii now let's dismantle it and that never took off because that bureaucratic apparatus was too useful. And of course we launched right into the Korean war and then everything else that happened in the, in the cold war to make that app, the, you know, what Eisenhower called the military industrial complex. Now that that's a term that I hate when leftists use, but it just is part of our lexicon at this point, you know? Um, Cause you know, but the, you know, I we, can I comment on that a second? Because yeah, I go ahead, yeah. was just literally just reading a chapter in Christopher Lash's Culture of Narcissism that talked about the educational debates in the 40s and 50s, specifically about this. Mm -hmm. um, so the universal military service was supposed to be used as a sorter for capital as a way to figure out like who was going to be the managerial uh, elites. This is something predicted even by James Burnham in, in his book, The Machiavellians, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And what I find interesting is when universal conscription kind of falls through and then they make it selective in a way that really benefits the upper middle class, i.e. if you can afford to go to college, you can get out of universal service, uh, the Vietnam story. Um, and when that pushes, you know, conscription to high levels of unpopularity because of the nature of that war, um, what we then see is universities get actually deliberately targeted at, to do the same sorting that the military was predicted as doing in the 50s. Yeah, and the administrators at universities are very conscious of that. There's an amazing essay by Clark Kerr, who is the uh, president of the Board of Regents for the University of California, called Problems in the Multiversity, which I think he wrote in the early 60s, mm -hmm. where his I, he, he is a liberal – but he's a Cold War liberal, and he is saying, basically, I want to turn the University of California, which is one of the largest education systems in America, into a Cold War machine. Like, that's what it's supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be the intellectual and technological production for the Cold War. 
And he coined this term multiversity to talk about that. Now, when the free speech riots happened in Berkeley, there were people there reading Clark Kerr and critiquing it in real time. There's this amazing guy I met when I lived in Berkeley, uh, Bradford Cleveland, who wrote a rebuttal to Clark Kerr that's amazing. I wish I could find it. It's very out of print. I think I transcribed it and published it on a website at one point. I'll have to hunt it down for you. But again, he's like a talking in like the 60s language, which kind of turns me off a little. But basically what he's saying is, you know, all of the heads of the universities, you look at who's on the boards of regents and they are people from Anaconda Copper, and they are people from oil companies, and they are people from Hewlett Packard and IBM, and they're they want to create this educational structure. The whole reason we're going to put so many people in college is to create the kind of knowledge production that the USA is going to need to, to beat the Soviets. Yeah, I think I think people completely misunderstand this i mean i would tell people to read lewis manan's uh breakdown of the university in the cold war and a whole lot of our university problems that have happened in a neoliberalism actually kind of comes from this expansion during you know yes there's a positive end of the gi bill mm-hmm. there's also this other end of it which includes a massive expansion of people avoiding the draft in the 1960s the the fact that there was until very recently credentialing drift so all these jobs that did not traditionally need any credential beyond high school or even that um all of a sudden required uh bachelors some of them started requiring masters where traditionally they required nothing sure um, and it was it was also about slamming the door shut on any kind of proletarian culture that could compete with bourgeois culture. Like the the very idea of proletarian culture, you bring kids to college, you train them that they're all bourgeois, and then they never get that, You they lose the very concept of proletarian culture. Yeah, I think this is actually important because it explains mm-hmm. some things about like, for example, the OSS slash CIA's interest in um, the MFA program, which was to, mm-hmm. not that, the you know the socialist art scene in new york, in new york or are the beatniks in california or whatever were like particularly actually working class they weren't but this this did break up any connection that they might have to the actual working class by removing them from communities and putting them at kind of isolated academic silos and while we think of the university as a radicalizing thing um I think because of the long march, the universities deliberately taken up by certain communist intellectuals in the 1970s. The reality is that it's always been a liberalizing institution. And I mean that in the worst sense of that word. Oh, I absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Like, but, like, you know, I'm learning Yiddish right now. And so I'm reading Yiddish newspapers, socialist Yiddish newspapers from the first half of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. And they're amazingly cosmopolitan and they're amazingly they have so much breadth and depth to them and they're talking about all the issues that are happening in the world and they are very very proletarian and you know um there was a big schism between the two strands of the yiddish socialist newspaper world between the ones who became full-on communists and then Stalinists and then clung to the Communist Party long past its use-by date, and the ones who were just more of a melange of anarchism, socialism, some Menshevism in there, um, some Leninism, but not, and Trotskyism, was all sort of blended together in the Yiddish press. And, you know, there's an archive that you can find online of 50 years of the Ladies' Garment Union, which from the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire to the next 50 years had a Yiddish language only paper for garment workers that is on fire and also has poetry published in it and art published in it and news of the world that's very in depth and very interesting. So there were other ways to learn about the world to be knowledgeable, to appreciate poetry and drama and art 
that didn't have to take a university trajectory. I think that's important to talk about. I mean, because because the 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 focus of of mass parties before the 20th century, and I know we, the Democrats and Republicans in the United States are are voter based parties. Uh, but they've never been mass parties and that they've never actually required anybody to really do anything to be one. But the, the, the mass parties that existed, the first one's the British Tories. That's a different thing. Then you have the SP day, yeah. but they existed largely to encourage this sort of educational culture. Sure. Um, and, uh, Yes, that that led to like partisan control of the newspapers and stuff that we've kind of gotten reused to in the last 30 years. But it also led to like there being real arts programs that didn't that in the idea of like making this generally available uh, was really big in that scene. Um, what I find ha what I've been frustrated with uh, in in socialist media and stuff um is that we have kind of not totally picked back up that mission of of being an educational apparatus, assuming that people don't go to college. Like, yeah, yeah. And like you know, that's I mean, like you know, go, Krupskaya going all the way back was always doing education mm -hmm. of workers, and and you know, Gramsci writes about this a lot. You know, there's a in the socialist tradition, it's all there. And in Yiddish socialist culture, this is very, very serious. I mean, the the two splits were called the right and the left. And the right-wing paper, according to them, was Der Vorwärts, which is still around today. It's a great newspaper. I read it every day. And the right-wing paper had on its masthead, workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like that was the right wing of the y of the Yiddish press. Yeah, th I think that's th th that's also interesting. I I've told people when we talk about left and right, we have to be careful to always contextualize it because, for example, when I talk about the communist left, the communist center, and the communist right, yeah. I actually it has no relationship to like most of what we talk about in the United States. Um, sure. It's a good way to start thinking about this, though, because they're relative to a context, like. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's unclear. I think right now, for example, we live in an age where socialism is very popular, but also what the hell it means is, is, uh, if I'm being charitable contested, uh, category, uh, territory, if I'm being uncharitable, no one really knows what the hell fuck they're talking about. Like, it's, I think you're, I'm closer to the latter on that. <laughs> yeah. You know? I mean, it's just like, no, socialism is not just social good. Stop it. Stop. Yeah. Um, but what I find interesting about cybernetic theory is cybernetic theory does solve a problem. All right. The, 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 the critical problem for planning and socialism, historically speaking, is that we want to get rid of class society, but we need bureaucrats and managers to do it. And in doing so, we have to maintain vestiges of class society. Marx actually worries about this and writes about it. And like his labor tokens is like his concession to trying to get over this. Like, okay, fine. We know we have to compensate people. We're going to compensate them on hours that are non-fungible. He doesn't say anything about paying different professions differently. It's value added. People read that into it. It's not there. I'm cutting off what some people have misread. But he does say, for example, that like we should pay people based on hours worked. Um, not just compensation after, and it should be split up equally after you divide up what you need for the social surplus. Um, uh, the Soviet Union took that as reinvesting, but in generally it's like what you need to reinvest and also provide for those who can't work, which yeah. is something Marx is actually concerned about. He doesn't just think we should kill all the sick people. <laughs> um, uh, and in fact, it makes a point about that. So it, I do think, you know, okay, that's a problem though, because it doesn't take anyone can think about this for 30 seconds and see like you compensate people on hours worked. If they can hoard that, even if they can't transfer it, if they can hoard it, you could see them reestablishing cartel groups. And particularly if that gives them access to, to other means of education, the, you have a counter weight 
to the to the leveling of paying people equally per hour um and so that's a problem mm -hmm. uh and it's not a problem that we figure out a way around i mean initially i mean you also have a uh, you know Robert, Mich uh, Robert Michel, who was a socialist who became evil. Um, so, you know, but but how he became evil and well, I shouldn't use evil. It's a very weighted term. But but M Robert Michel was a, was a socialist anarchist loosely com uh, connected to both Italian and French socialist parties who gives up on socialism because of the tendency to build oligarchy a tendency that he describes that i think is actually very real um and we don't really have an answer for it until the development of cybernetic theory mm -hmm. like because what you need is a way to systematize things that doesn't create bottlenecks for individuals to amass uh, opportunity hoarding or information hoarding yeah. And cybernetic theory is a way to equalize a lot of the information if you design it to do that. Like if the system you design yeah. is designed to do that. Stafford is very conscious of that. I mean, it, it must sound a little pretentious that I'm calling him Stafford when I never met him. But you go to Stafford Beer Circles, the think tank metaphorum and stuff, and everyone just calls him Stafford. You know, I mean, he looks like a Stafford. I can't think of <laughs> you know? like imagine calling him Mr. Beer or Dr. Beer just doesn't work for me. So we're yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's oh. we can, we'll both assume first name here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was very, very conscious of that. The key point, you know, uh, it's a given we are going to develop tools. We're we're hominids. Hominids make tools, you know, but that the point is to make tools that make our lives better. And to organize around that. So one of the key concepts that Stafford has, I think probably the most important concept that no one ever talks about, you know, so many people like Cockshot and other people are talking about Stafford, but he dropped the challenge for us that he himself was not able to solve. And I am intrigued by this, which is he was very, very influenced by the Nicomachean ethics of Aristotle. And one of the ideas he picks up again and again well, is called um, uh, is eudaimony. Mm -hmm. And his idea is that the purpose of all of these systems should be to maximize eudaimony in the individual and in society. And there's some of that Norbert Wiener's the human use of human beings. And it's not doesn't come from Stafford. I mean, there's a lot of that in Walter Gray in um, in Ashby. I mean, Walter Gray was openly an anarchist, you know, and um, and their idea was that we're watching these new ways of shaping information, of tracking information, new ways of building logistics, new ways of designing cities, new ways of mapping the brain. And all of this should be about maximizing eudaimony. And eudaimony is a hard word to define. Basically, you know, we're all kind of influenced by this, you know, by sort of junk science versions of things like, like Maslow's pyramid, hierarchy pyramid and things like that. But the idea of eudaimony is to live your best self in a way that allows that horizon to expand and expand and expand both at the individual, the social level, the neighborhood level, the nation level, and the planet level. And Stafford says in Platform for Change that um, uh, that we think about money because money is easy to measure. It's a number, and therefore numbers can always be measured. And money is terribly important in capitalist society as a constraint on eudaimony that money's role in the cybernetic Stafford was talking about is that it gives a natural constraint to the amount of eudaimony society can deliver. And therefore we need to pay attention to it. We run out of money and our projects fail. We run out of money and our tasks fail, but always what money is doing is putting a constraint on eudaimony and that expanding that eudaimony is a really important thing.
What I find interesting about about Stafford's research is by the end of his experimentation in Chile, he becomes one of the the few system, you know, non left communist system thinkers to actually start flirting with the idea that you could have a society that didn't have a currency. Yeah. Um, which uh, the left right now seems to be running in the exact opposite direction, where like everything now is about like, well, if we just can play with the money, we could do. Uh, by by expanding general credit or having, you, you know, this credit expand universal basic income or whatever, which um, I find interesting, but that doesn't really solve the problem of, of of planners. I mean, even in the case of modern monetary theory, they need a massive cadre of state planners to figure out where they're going to invest and suck up this currency they're going to put in, and they don't talk about that very much. So I mean, it's like tweaking the currency is a hack it's not a solution like i mean the ezra pound was obsessed with the idea of perishable money he had oh this yeah, idea, yeah. You know? the, the, the fashion okay now <laughs> i don't talk about this often yeah but but after the historicist school kind of broke with marxism hmm. uh the early charterists were part of this historical school of sociology and they kept on drifting right wing Initially, they're kind of tied into Lasallian socialism, mm -hmm. um, and they, like Lasalle himself, assumed that law was neutral and was not class. And Marx actually, despite what Marxists often think, sided with the anarchists that while he didn't think we could get rid of the state immediately, that it, that and Lenin even agreed with him that law and state is inherently classed. Like that, yeah. there is no way around that. Um, Okay, different, uh, kind of interesting. But what I find fascinating is like, and MMTers, I'll give them credit, they will admit you could use their theories in very right-wing and nationalistic ways. Uh, some of them don't seem to care, some of them do. Um, but the historicist school got tied in with fascism pretty quickly. Shaktism, not Shackmanism. People think I'm referring to Max Shackman. I'm referring to Shakt, who was a... Uh, a, a a fascist uh, financial planner in on their rise up um, was highly influenced by chartalism. Mm -hmm. um, or the Strasserite brothers, you know? The yeah. The Strasserite um, and, and <clears throat> Ezra pounds. I mean, if you read the cantos, that was some of the sure. weirdest stuff going through the cantos <laughs> in college. I'm like, why are they these fucking poems about, about silver money and William Jennings, Bryan and like, and like going back to colonial money systems, and I and and so yeah, I don't think there's anything inherently progressive about. Um, I don't think there's anything inherently progressive about anything, but I, I really don't think there's anything inherently left wing about some of these monetary schemas. Uh, sure. I don't also think they're inherently right wing, but they're just they're a way to deal with bottlenecks. In capitalism, when someone tries to to say it like they're a market socialist or whatever, and I'm my my thoughts are often is like, well, you're not a socialist, mm -hmm. like like sorry, like now th that said, I will say, capitalism is not the only social uh, social system that has used a form of currency as a type of information transfer. Markets are not unique to capital. Sure. Otherwise, you have capitalism going all the way back to like. As long as we've known it, there's been human beings and symbolic representation, but um, and capitalism is, is a little bit more specific than that. So I, I will say you you maybe can have market societies that are non-capitalistic. I'm not uh, like, but I'm not sure that they're socialist. But that's a semantic argument. Yeah, get back sure. to the systems, <laughs> yeah, the yeah. systems yeah. argument. I think that's important to get though. I mean, because this is the neoliberal specifically justification for capitalism as it exists yeah. what von hayek really tries to do is argue that like an ecological system that currency that the invisible hand is actually that currency is an aggregated marker of of knowledge and want and drives and that we can use it as a system um, to allocate resources. Now, of course, this ignores that there was never equal access to it ever, ever. 
Um, it's a political creation that was created <laughs> specific, you know, with specific goals and with specific accesses. I mean, um, just because something's a constraint doesn't mean it's not integral to the thing. I mean, I'm, I'm a mathematician. You can define mathematical objects by the constraints upon them, you know? Yeah, that's actually an important point. I, and, and actually, it's I think a lot of Marxists, because they don't understand math, um, <laughs> uh, don't miss this when I talk about, like, constraints and limits being definitional. Um, and I'm like... and but different from determinations. Like we have a lot of things we can do within a set constraint, but we're defined by our constraint. Like, like a lot of the time. Um, and, and so when we talk about, for example, like what human beings can do, and I think Marx is actually really good on this uh, in, in a way that for someone writing when he's writing is kind of brilliantly intuitive with that whole stuff about man makes his, uh, uh, man makes history, but not of his own making is like, we are constrained. We can change what makes human beings unique is we understand our constraints enough to change the constraints, yeah. but those constraints are our limits. They are, True. they they are real. And this is why just saying, believing a better world is possible is never good enough for me because I'm like, no, what okay now that we realize that a better world is possible what constraints could we change to incentivize that better world because once you do that you can start building it if you don't do that you're not you're not going to build towards anything capitalism has a very particular set of constraints its main constraint is the accumulation of of abstract value um and the exhaustion of resources to do that hence why there Hence why capitalism, capitalist production will do things that doesn't even make sense from the capitalist standpoint in aggregate, sure. right? Because it's being driven by that need to generate more and more value on paper. And, and, and that's real power in the sense that like you can use it to command things. Like it's not the, the, the paperness of it or the moneyness of it is kind of a mystification of what is going on. Sure, um, like Stafford, if you look at him himself, the man, he fell into the mistake of focusing more on the eudemony and also entelechy is another thing that he gets very into and less on the money, which is the constraint on eudemony and went broke, you know, and ended up having to sell his intellectual property and could not achieve some of the objectives he had. Now he also was processing a great deal of PTSD from the Chile thing. Um, but you have to pay attention to your constraints. You can't ignore them. And I think that, I think that's why I think that's one of the things that has made cybernetics so interesting is because it does take constraints seriously um and it it also takes things like uh like for example when people go well there always needs to be leadership so i've been theorists know that yeah. like um it they're what what they're what they're worried about like when it comes to people is that those roles are fungible so they well, can be moved around like yeah. all the time like, yeah i mean there's a chapter of Brain of the Firm mm -hmm. in which he plays out a scenario in which a CEO has to make major decisions about his company. And um, and comes, you know, it's almost one of these Zeno paradoxes where it's impossible for the CEO working alone to make the right choice. That the only way the CEO can solve the problem is to immerse in the neural net that is the company and emerge from it with a solution. And when I say neural net, I don't mean it in the modern computer sense of the term, but I mean in the sense of dive deep into like the fibrous series of connections between all the people at the company, get the collective wisdom of the company and emerge with it. That if the CEO acts alone, contra to the way the company is going, they're just going to make bad decisions. And so he 
he's extrapolating that to a theory of leadership in general, which is that really the way leadership should work in a cybernetic system is primarily about clinging to ethos. And so principles matter after all. <laughs> oh, absolutely. They are the capstone of, you know, Stafford came up with a system called the viable system model. And mm. I love the viable system model. And if it's explained badly, everyone's eyes glaze over and no one is the wiser. So I think it's very fraught. Uh, Kyle from uh, um, General Intellect Unit. I wrote what I thought was a very good explainer of the um, of the viable system model. It's on vsru.org, which is the website we all worked on together. Um, and I think it's very good. And John Walker, who is a student at Stafford's, has a very good one as well. But the problem is it viable system model only makes sense when you are using it. I love this idea. You know, there's a struggle between theory and praxis, and the viable system model is argle bargle without praxis. It just doesn't even it's it's a fantasy that some socialists have in their heads until they implement it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, if you, it, it's it's actually kind of frustrating. Uh, I, I'm going to just intervene here when I talk to talk to people who are really into cybernetics, and they just start throwing off. System one, system two, system three from the viable system model. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about to outsiders? Like, I yeah. vaguely know what you're talking about, but like, you can't talk that way. And, and, no. uh, and the reason why I say I've been actually really big on this, I'm even trying to do this with Marxists now, where I'm, I used to be one of these really stickler on technical vocabulary. And I'm like, no, you know what? We need to use the technical vocabulary amongst ourselves, mm -hmm. and I need to educate people on it. But that's not what you should be using for, for like general communication. Yeah. And that's even more true with cybernetics. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like... It's worth looking at Raul Espejo's um, – what he did with Stafford's mm -hmm. models and systems. Um, Raul Espejo was the chief of uh, – chief scientific officer for Project CyberSense. And he's still alive. He lives in London. Um, he goes to Metaform every year. He's a lovely, lovely guy. But he renamed the pieces so that they weren't just numbers anymore. Um, but I still struggle with it. Like, I think, you know, one of the things I learned in studying the, the viable system model is you really need to learn it within the organization and then just not use any of that terminology when talking to people outside the organization right. because people's eyes just glaze over. Like, you know, I was talking to one person who was a management consultant who was at a Metaforum and he was saying, I do the viable system model for a living and I never tell any of my clients any of it. I just dispense what I've concluded using the model and everyone thinks I'm a genius. And one in 20 clients ever asks me what the secret sauce is. Um, that's frustrating for us who are theoreticians, who are planners, who are trying to create, use these tools in socialism. But I think it's really important to build it rather than tell it. Because when the tool is functioning and humming along and working, then it becomes clear what it's doing, but it doesn't become clear when you just explain it. Right. But, you know, it would mean actually, so, so one of the things I've been trying to get people to think about a, a lot more is on one hand, I'm telling people like, Oh, beliefs are not super important in a lot of ways. Um, like, Having someone accept the exact right political program actually won't necessarily get you what you want. Um, you, and you have no idea how to build the exact right uh, political program. Either, Worse than that, Derek, back. I think the, the need for leftists to be right destroys movements. I think it absolutely shatters them. I mean, you can see that with the CPUSA, where it would have been a much better party if it didn't 
police its own members as much. If you know, like all of the factions, all the fighting, there was lots of stuff the left could have done collectively that would have been much better if they weren't so obsessed with being right and they were more obsessed with scoring victories. Right. Well, I mean, I actually point that out. I mean, mm -hmm. I, like, like it once someone has won. They tend to operate off of background principles that are assumptions, not explicit programs like that. Sure. Um, like, no one has to tell anybody what liberalism is. And in fact, no one knows. <laughs> and I, I actually mean that as I've spent like years trying to figure out what it fucking is. And I've just realized, you know what? It has a couple of operational principles. They can be broken down into bourgeois virtues, but they don't actually work that way. Um, they never have. That's again what Marx like pointed out about the the perpetually unfinished nature of the bourgeois revolution. I mean, although at the time I'd like to remind people, some of those bourgeois revolutions really were literally unfinished. There were still like like um yeah, uh but like England still has nobility, <laughs> like just put that out there. But um even beyond that though, that and it's because it's operational principles. Uh, are incoherent, but they're also not explicitly stated. Like you don't have to. Like, um, like when when someone gives me like you know liberal principles and and they're like you know freedom from whatever and like freedom from fear and I'm like no one actually believes that. Um, and then I state out so I'm like it's it, it is the life, liberty, and what Locke said, not what we said. The pursuit of property or the maintenance of property. That's the basis. Of liberalism uh some of those even communists might still find good but the thing is those things are are internal constraints on each other like you can't have a fully free society and have property property necessitates a kind of unfreedom sure. like um and though and we don't have to articulate that anymore and no one's got a political program that just goes out and spells out what all that means but it is the ethos that drives, you know, the development of liberal states in, 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 in some real degree, although which ones they favor tends to be property over all the others, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but I think that's an important thing to realize. So, yeah. And, and I, and like nobody set out a political program for, for the capitalist bourgeois parties and, and liberal modernity to begin either. Now I do believe and programmatic unity, hmm. but the way to get programmatic unity would be to have systems that would that that have principles. And in the early stages, if you had good systems, you could generate specific principles for the specific thing that you're doing. But they're going to change all the time. Sure, and you know, the core part of the viable system model. You know, you've probably seen those pictures of the circle of Star Trek chairs. That was like the control room. But Stafford's idea was, okay, so there's a term I'm going to, one of the things that's frustrating about reading Stafford is he creates his own terminology. He makes up words all the time. Sometimes he redefines you a, a bunch of, of stuff from ancient Greek. Like <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's stuff from ancient Greek and stuff. But one of the terms in the viable system model, and one of the functional terms is recursion. Mm -hmm. So his idea is, your cell in your finger, you know, a blood cell in your finger is trying to remain a blood cell and trying to perpetuate itself in its existence as a blood cell. And when it stops, it just dies. And that's fine because there's lots of blood cells. And then the tissue of like, you know, your finger as a mechanism is trying to remain a finger and do stuff as a finger. It's not trying to just now turn into a tentacle or try to turn into a bus, it's going to try and stay a finger. And then your hand is going to be your hand and you are most of the energy, the calories you consume, all that stuff is going in to perpetuating yourself as an organism in the universe. And then your family is trying to keep your family afloat. Your neighborhood is trying to keep your neighborhood afloat. All the way along, these are all levels of recursion. And the viable system model, which I'm not going to delineate, it's it's a waste of time over a podcast, is designed to 
work at each level of recursion that the analyst is concerned with. And at any given time, Stafford says, pay attention to your level of recursion, the level of recursion immediately above you and the level of commercial of recursion immediately below you at minimum, but you're going to lose your mind if you're trying to keep 14 levels of recursion in your head at any given time, you know, it's too much information. It's too much information, but the strategies are designed that way. So his idea of the, you know, this room where everyone is conferring and working out how they're going to decide how to deal with things as they happen those rooms should exist at every level of recursion. His fantasy was that you have a worker in a factory and that worker in the factory is a smart, trained person who knows how to do their job. You know, the old adage, those closest to the coal face know how to cut coal, you know. But then you have a team of people on the shop floor. You might have a shop foreman. And they know how to do the thing that they do together. And then, of course, that floor of the factory is going to know how to do what it does. The factory itself is going to know what it's going to do. The logistics chain that includes that factory is, and each of them is perpetuating their own existence. And there should be levels of coordination going up and down the chain by people cognizant of what's happening at a higher level of recursion, what's happening at a lower level of recursion, but also what strategies need to be done to keep what's happening going, but also to plan for the future. So, I mean, that's – if you look at Berian tactics, Berian tactics – involve a term, another term that he didn't coin called autopoiesis. And autopoiesis, if you look at the Greek, it just means... Self-making. Yeah, self-making, self-creation. And his idea was that all systems tend towards some level of autopoiesis, because if they didn't, they would blink out of existence. And that's a very important thing, but that ultimately in your environment is changing all the time. So autopoiesis starts with preserving what's happening at your level of recursion, but then also taking into account what's happening in the environment and correspondingly dealing tactically with the changes that are happening in the environment. So it starts with autopoiesis and then it looks to what, what's called system four. And again, I hate these numbers um, is taking in what's happening in the environment and planning accordingly. And then at the top level, the apex system five, again, the numbers are annoying, is an ethos. How do we hold the whole system together? What is our purpose? What are we trying to accomplish? Now, even the capitalists know that. You look at a startup doing a press release about a new startup. One of the things they're going to talk about is their mission statement. You know, right off the bat, even the capitalists know without a mission statement, you don't have a company. Right. I, I talk about this, you know, as annoying as these things are. And trust me, I've written a lot of them because I'm involved in schools. Schools operate this way, yeah. regardless of whatever thing, thing. We we have missions and values. Our norms are set by the mission and values. We we're police them ourselves, which uh, is kind of why I hate liberal regulatory drift, because because it it confuses these principles down to specific things that you can't really always uh, pin down. I mean, we all know about the problems of fucking minimum wage since it's not set to any adjustment to inflation. Uh, also, uh, the best ways to handle the societies that have handled this, even in capitalist system, better. I don't even set a minimum wage. They they have collective bargaining units that are that are strategically embedded um and yes there are problems with that i've talked about like in sweden the collusion to 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 fight inflation by suppressing wages it was done with the unions um but in general and i've lived in scandinavia i know i lived in norway so yeah yeah you got it but, but yeah. you know for, for our american listeners you don't get this <laughs> but it does in general actually like when you look at the average wage in norway and figure out what a living wage would be it is pretty fucking close Whereas here, <laughs> like, and because people don't understand relative to nominal wages, you have all these, like, I, I work with people and they're sweet people and they're not even, a lot of them are not even conservatives. 
but they'll start whining about like, well, kids today make $15 an hour. And I'm like, do inflation adjustment for 40 years. Like that's, it's less purchasing power than $7 an hour was when we were kids. Like, but you are, you're stuck on nominal wages. Also, you know, if, if teachers realize their nominal wages, they get kind of mad. And then I remind them that we're still in the top 50% of income brackets. So imagine how everybody else fucking feels. Um, But um, top 50% actually doesn't mean that much because you start looking like, Real wealth is all above one percent or higher. The, the my my point about this though, this long ranty bit here, is that is that uh, cybernetic style stuff is what most firms and planning uh, planning systems do, and it's one of the reasons, one of the legit critiques of the way a lot of liberal institutions work. Um, into the governmental sector is they are rules driven, not principles driven. Um, and businesses tend to be rules enforcing, but principles driven, meaning rules, rules come down to enforce principles and they're kind of actually arbitrary. Um, it, but that does give them a flexibility. Um, now, if your if your principles suck and they set constraints that are awful, uh, such as you talk about money as a constraint on eudaimonia, or literally money as a constraint on the possibility of being happy, <laughs> um, let's, I mean, let's, that's literally what what Zappert is saying, right? Like like mm-hmm. to put it in common language, um, and no, not, I think Zappert understands that having infinite money does not mean you will be happy, but if you have less than a certain amount, you will likely be unhappy yeah. um, uh, because your constraints are different. So, well, I mean, one of the things Stafford tried to do, and I I don't know what to make of this, Derek. Mm-hmm. I, I don't have an answer for this. But he asked his readers and his the people he worked with to come up with a good metric for you, Demonic so that we could continually measure the happiness of people at every level of recursion and adjust accordingly to maximize a metrized eudaimony. And I don't know how you do that. And I'm not even sure that's possible, but I think it's in the challenge. We should be cognizant of the happiness and in the eudaimonic sense of happiness, not just, you know, not just Epicurean happiness, but a deeper kind of happiness, you know? I mean, although Epicurus is misquoted, but, you know, like uh, Epicurus is anatraxia, which is, which is also a deeper kind of, uh, it's not happiness. It's free from worry, but yeah. Um, I mean like vulgar Epicureanism, you know? Right, yeah. But uh, yeah. like the, uh, you know, I was in a, I was in a conference one time. I'll just tell this anecdote just at the time where Someone, two people were arguing on some crazy philosophical point, and uh, someone said, Well, what's your whole philosophy here? What are you trying to say? And he was like, Well, I just want you know people to be happy, I just you know, I you know, to to have pleasure in life, to be happy. And the person interrogator said, Whoever said pleasure was happiness, and they said, Epicurus, <laughs> and this sort of ended the argument, you know. Well, that's funny. <laughs> um <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, he did, uh, <laughs> but he, but what he said, is what is pleasurable is what is most attainable, and what is most attainable is to be free of worry. Uh, yeah. There are, I mean, <laughs> to go on my 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 really deep ancient Greek history philosophy nerd, there is actually a school of of uh, post Socratics that are what we think of Epicureans. That's the Cyrenaics. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they 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 are a real thing. Um, but Epicureans are a lot more like Buddhist, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're like, nah, fuck society. Go live in the woods in a garden, grow your shit, and like learn to really enjoy a good peach because you can get that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think going back to this idea of metrizable uh, mm. eudaimony, I think that's. I don't. I wouldn't say that's an impossible task, but I think that's a very very difficult challenge. Yeah, I, um, whatever you think of Ashley Frawley, her work on the problems of happiness studies really is uh, helpful here because it's mm-hmm. like 
well, we all define happiness differently. Like, um, we have cultural norms for what we think joy should be. I mean, all these operative terms are variable. And happiness quotients that get yeah. spun by ec economists and stuff. But I think, you know, what I learned in mathematics, my, my master's advisor said it's much more important to ask the question to get than getting the answer. That you can ask unbelievable, amazing questions and have them be incredibly fruitful and then just have the door shut by the answer. So like, you know, example, like Fermat's last theorem was posed in the 1640s. Uh, Fermat said that he had a proof, but he never wrote, he wrote it down somewhere else and no one found it. And it was finally solved by Andrew Wiles in the mid 1990s. I mean, this is like a 350 year old open problem, but so much of modern mathematics was built on continually striving to answer that question. I mean, the whole edifice of algebraic geometry, number theory, abstract algebra, um, you know, at least 12 generations of people who thought they had solved it and got very, very far only to find they hadn't. I think, you know, ripping our hearts out to solve the problem of how do we measure eudaimony is not a bad line of interrogation, even if we don't expect an outcome. Because I think that, it, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, this is the problem. Like, this is a problem I have with them, with Marxists who've reduced Marxism to, re, to purely uh, um, productive forces. And I'm like, productive for what? Yeah, like, yeah. like, that's the question. If productivity is defined by you the same way it is defined by capitalists, then you're going to have a system, even if it isn't capitalist. And I don't want to get into those debates because I find a lot of them to be semantic. You see, um, I got into Marxism through the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844. I know that was my entryway. I was an anarchist before that. I was informed by punk rock lyrics and then finally reading Emma Goldman and then other people. So all the structural anti-humanist Marxists are now got, you know, guns at your head. Is what oh, right. of course. And they can all go fuck themselves. Oh, good. That's the proper. For opinion. me, I was very skeptical of Marxism. I disparaged Marx without ever having read anything. I was a smart ass. And then I read the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844. And the problem of alienation jumped out at me. Mm -hmm. And I've been struggling with it ever since. See, I mean, I'm someone who is clinically depressed. I go through life struggling with depression every day. And alienation and depression, I think, are very deeply tied together. I find it interesting. Um, I find it interesting because one, on one hand, I worry about psychology used as, you know, what we might call the therapeutic, which is just to have people accept things that they probably shouldn't accept and and deal with it in psychological frameworks that neutral, neutralize it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I'm one of the big components, and I've literally done a series of this, is alienation is real. We have both sociological and psychological evidence for it. And the reasons why it is real, as felt in our real life, is people take your stuff away. You don't feel connected to the stuff you make. It breaks down social bonds because... As Mark says, what's one of the greatest rewards in life is to make something that that feeds someone else's need. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and it's fucking true. Yeah. Like, you remember the passage, money is alienated ability? Mm -hmm. I think that's amazing stuff. The idea that, you know, money is ability at a level of separation. It's alienated you know, the, the Marx passage where he's like, I am ugly, but with money, I can buy attractive companions. I am stupid, but with money, I can buy advisors. This, I, I think, you know, um, we have money and alienation rather than true solutions to the problems we face. Right, which is why, all, I mean, you know, lately out of the text period, your point about uh, there's two things. One, that now that uh, debt is now more expensive and leveraging debt off of other rent streams is really hard to do. So much of this investor venture capital has just gone away and we've just seen massive of like like we've seen 2000. We're, I think we're seeing 2007 
in the tech sector, but maybe the tech sector only. I don't know though. We'll we'll see. It won't be the mortgage sector. I we're say also that. seeing mass layoffs mm -hmm. because everyone is doing it. Like we're not even seeing intelligent strategic layoffs. No, happen. I've been I was literally talking to someone working who works in a tech field. I was like, yeah, we've been like some of these tech companies are literally laying people off and then immediately having to rehire some of them back because they didn't even plan right. And I'm I got like, laid off last year from a tech company and I, I, I don't know how much it is covered by an NDA, so I got to be careful. But um, I built a whole wing to open up the healthcare market for this company. I mean, I wasn't alone. A lot of us worked on this. And then every single person who built that is gone. And so they are stripped of everybody who knows how to talk to the kind of clients they're trying to attract. They're gone. So they have a corporate objective of landing a bunch of these clients while at the same time they've laid off everyone who knows that industry and knows how to talk to them. Yeah, we see a lot of that, particularly in the tech sector. And to me, that tells you, one, that, well, there's a couple things. One, all the people who were predicting like this techno neo-feudalism, all it took was a, was a, a a kind of medium term spike in the cost of debt and that went to shit. Um, but two, and I think more importantly, is that the principles driving even this disruption is not even efficiency. It is literally just um, profit maximization. And, and this is legally enshrined in any publicly traded company. And you will always see people bring it up when someone does something something stupid i was just in D, D debates and watching people go well but they have to maximize shareholder profits out on times and i'm like what's funny about this is they're actually hurting shareholder profits by their attempts to maximize it because you've had a bunch of incentive systems uh where you hire people who don't even understand the field that they're working in now based off of these principles of of to get really technical like the, a lot of these people treat fields of, of industry as homologous to one another, even though they're not. And so they think they can just take somebody from one field and pluck them down in the, uh, into another field and it worked the same way. And they collapse the field. Yeah, so yeah. like you know, I see it with with, you know, venture capitalists who are like under 30 boys who have not evolved into men in any kind of spiritual way, who think that money is going to make that happen, just banding about the stupidest fucking ideas imaginable, getting hype on them, and then getting investments, and before you know it, they're billion-dollar companies. And that's just not sustainable. I mean, we're watching sort of the dregs as the Californian ideology just sort of got dragged through the last 40 years, you know? And what's left is just sort of like a bloody stripe in the road, it personified by Elon Musk, you know? Right. Uh, what, I, what, what I find worrying about that, honestly, to, to turn it back to system thinking uh, as, as much as cybernetics, and again, I, as I've said, I'm not sure I know where system thinking ends and cybernetic begins all the time. Sure. But uh, uh, but uh, I'm worried because last time, uh, whether or not you think China is socialist, uh, I'm on record as saying no. But but uh, that's irrelevant to this. It has to participate in the global economy. Um, its growth rate has slowed significantly, and it has it does have a demographic crash in the short run. No society on earth has ever seen. Uh, like we, we, we've never seen, you know, a natural die off of that much of the population, uh, in a, in a shortest period of time, uh, because of, because of age imbalances as will likely happen in China. Now, conservatives make a lot of this. I'm not saying like, they're like, Oh, China's going to stop existing in 10 years. They've been telling me that since the nineties. So take, you know, don't, <laughs> don't judge anything about this, but that demographic crisis is real. And that means two things. Uh, the, the global engine of capital was restarted by, by, by there actually being 
a quote Chinese middle class developing out of its proletarian origins that really got solidified and stabilized by some reforms by Xi in 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 the mid aught teens, and that really pushed everyone's world production back up. There isn't any society right now who can play that role, except maybe the U.S. itself, mm. which is which it's not in position to do anything like China could do just just in scale. Yeah. Uh, and it's declining, you know. Um, so where you at? Like so in a system thinking way, I'm I am worried for the future. Um, but in a long term thinking way. I want more socialists to start thinking about this because if we're going to have a political program and we're going to unite around a political program, and I always tell people, you got to be people to unite around a common interest. And I mean that in both, but interest has got to be bounded by principle. Otherwise you can't build a subject that could hold to that interest. Like you can't. And if you ask people to enter politics purely off of the spirit of free will and cooperation, Grow the fuck up. Yeah. Like, like, there like, has to be a material benefit, and there has to not only be a material benefit, but you have to love your party as much as you love your basketball team. You know what I mean? Like, right. a deep in a deeper way, too, because, like, you know, I, I lived in North, I did my doctorate in North Carolina, where you cannot be basketball agnostic. Like, you either you love one and hate three of UNC, Duke, Wake Forest, and NC State. Yeah, I'm from. And Central you have to be Georgia, very careful Georgia. what bumper sticker you put on your car because cops will pull you over for having the wrong bumper sticker. You know, yeah, I, I feel that way about. Uh, I have a bizarre attachment to Georgia Tech football, which is <laughs> which is uh, not because I care. I do not give a shit about football. I am one. I am truly sports ball agnostic. But because I lived in the area I lived in, I had to declare a side and I declared a side where someone I liked went to school. So yeah. it was like it, yeah. it was like that. Um, also, it was a losing side. So you, so people didn't hate you as much as I hated the Gators. Um, but, I, you know, for me, like. I, I was talking to my my wife and my therapist about this, that I'm attracted to losers in a way that is the disease of the left. It and really is. Like, I, I I love losers. I, I love the Spanish Republic with a deep emotional love. I love Allende's Chile. I love Yiddish, which is a language that is dying very quickly. Although the and Renaissance I love Ladino, is inspiring. which is even more dead. So <laughs> I know. I, know. <laughs> I love the losers, but I just have this crazy idea. I mean, going back to Pound, there's a story about Pound had some fall. He ended up in a hospital in Italy. And um, the there was a nun taking care of him. who was a nurse. She was trying to figure out what his religion was. And she was like, what's your religion? I, I need to know what your religion is. It's Italy. You know, of course, you got to know what someone's religion is. And he was like, I gather the limbs of Osiris. <laughs> and like, I just feel like the left is gathering the limbs of Osiris in the hopes that they can wake Osiris up. And I don't know what else to do. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm mixed about that. Yeah. I'm on record of saying like, if anyone asks Giannis Varoufakis or Jeremy Corbyn to come on a show again, I'm just one. And they don't ask the question, what did you learn from your defeat? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you know, uh, cause I'm like, I was literally listening to Jeremy Corbyn talking about, uh, uh, Lula and I'm like, you know what? I can't learn anything about that. One, you're not Brazilian. Uh, two, like you're, you're you're brought on to represent, you know, this blog global left, but you lost. Uh, what did you learn from your defeat? Because yeah. because what I hear from people is, well, the security apparatus and Zionists got rid of them, and I'm like, okay, what country does not have a security apparatus, and what Western country doesn't have Zionists? Yeah, of course. Like, so, so that answer is you lost. So, so even if that's your, if that's the party that defeated you, I want to know why did it work? Like, and I want to know it from the person who lost and can they have, and if they can't answer that, then I don't care about anything else to say. Yeah. I mean, like, why, why did the, why did the red scare work? Yeah. 
Like, why didn't, why weren't there, why weren't, I mean, we the right army was more to- brittle. That was more brutal than the red, than any American red scare, even though the, there's been like, I'm always like, there's been six red scares in America. We have red scares like every two years. Um, you know, in my scholarship, I'm still, continually unlearning the cold war mentality i'm constantly shuffling it off i mean in yiddish literature you know there are these amazing anthologies trying to fight back over the death of yiddish that were done in like the 50s and 60s and 70s and trying to say yes this is american literature american literature is not only in english it is in Yiddish. Here is some of the great American literature of our time. Here's some poetry. Here's some plays. And they left out every communist. And it turns out that a lot of the best American Yiddish poets were communists. And so there's a big communism shaped hole in the scholarship of Yiddish poetry. I'm reading an anthology now of only communists by someone who's trying to write the record and say, these poets deserve to stand alongside everybody else. You don't know about them because all these anthologies were written in the wake of the Red Scare and everyone was terrified of including any communists because they'd be dragged before HUAC for writing it. I've been been, uh, recently going on the Marx in America kick um and and where you know there's been some libertarians talking about how marx was not very well received after his death he wasn't important and particularly in north america and i'm like it's funny though because he was important in the u.s during his life in both the english and the german press yeah um and the yiddish press I mean, he was all over the place in the united states particularly during the civil war i mean mm-hmm. literally up until the Civil War, he's writing for the largest Republican newspaper in the country, uh, it, one of the most read newspapers in the world, um, and it was published in the U.S. in English. So it, it's even funny because I'm like, a lot of Karl Marx's writing was written in English for an American audience, and ironically, that's the stuff that's the least read yeah, um, cause, because it's not really conducive to either the U.S. or the Soviet story of itself. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, with 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 the whole socialist Jewish thing, the Mm. heartbreak is there was a knockdown drag out fight between whether Yiddish or Hebrew would be the language of the Jews. And these fights were taking place at a time where 80 percent of all Jews spoke Yiddish. But there were pockets of Ladino speakers, of Judeo-Arabic speakers, of a lot of other things. So the Hebraists got the argument that this is a language for all Jews, not just the Ashkenazim. And there's a lot of nasty, racist, Ashkenazim uh, supremacy bullshit in Judaism. It's just disgusting, and yep. it's there. And it's, but still there, it's still there even in, in The perception Israel. was made in the old country and brought to America that Prol spoke Yiddish, the bourgeoisie spoke Hebrew. And because of that, there was a sense that if you spoke Yiddish, you had a proletarian culture built into your language. And it was people were very proud to be proletarian Yiddishists and very much clung to it. And with the Red Scare and the establishment of the state of Israel, there was a real sense of, I guess we drop our proletarian culture. I guess we drop Yiddish. The state of Israel is here. We all need to learn Hebrew now. We all need to be Zionists. And if you don't mind, I, I, I can expand this a little bit further. Which is, you know, in my father's lifetime, a third of my race was murdered. Like, and before that, in my grandfather and great-grandfather's lifetime, there were constant pogroms. And there were pogroms that killed 100,000 people. Like, we were on the edge of death and murder at the hands of our neighbors. And so... Jews really tried to figure out how do we get out of this nightmare? And the religious Jews turned to the religion and the hope that the Messiah would come. And the secular Jews were split between we need our own state and this won't happen anymore. And 
wherever we are, this is where we are. We need a socialist revolution, and then this won't happen anymore. And uh, and neither is right. I mean, Stalin. You know, I, you know, you read uh, Lenin's uh, on the right of nations to self determination. Stalin took that and said there needs to be a Yiddish language community in the USSR. Really attracted Jews there. Did a lot of built helped build a very very vibrant Yiddish culture. Yeah, and Brindabar, over decades, right? and then killed everybody. <laughs> you know, most of the great Yiddish writers ended up killed in the doctor's plot. Yeah, the the, the 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 whole Marxist notice we're not going to talk about the doctor's plot thing is one of the great uh, funny things when I see anti-Semites now on Twitter uh, try to say that I have some of my favorite one is it was uh, Iron Felix and and uh, Stalin were Jews. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. like uh, I mean, Iron Felix had no animosity towards Jews, but like, but what? What are you on? Like, yeah. Uh, Felix Dostoevsky comes from Dostoevsky. That's that's the Polish. That's a Polish noble house. Like, and then the the last secular approach was assimilation, right? Obviously. So there among the Ashkenazim, other Jews couldn't really pull this off as well. And some of the Sephardim, it was please God make me white. If I'm white, they won't get me. They'll think I'm one of them. And so you have these four strains. You have let's embrace whiteness and the dominant and assimilation. Let's embrace Israel. Let's embrace socialism or communism, or let's em embrace the Torah, you know? Yeah, my family is Sephardim, and, and they've been here for a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and most of them were, were uh, fully assimilated into... Scotch Irish or um or even like Slavic uh immigrant cultures. Sure. Uh and it, it and is, you know yeah. that's that's the that's the that's the history the his, the late 20th century is people rediscovering that they were part of long-standing Sephardic communities in the United States that uh went for the most part underground of uh, shortly after the civil war and fully assimilated in with, with fairly proletarian, maybe even I would say proto proletarian, to be honest, um, communities of like sharecroppers and whatnot, mm -hmm. particularly after uh, the bourgeoisie of the Jewish community was associated with the Confederacy and booted out of mm -hmm. uh of of the major cities in the south which is it a uh, part of american history that's been utterly erased except for well, like one grant month. kicked all the jews out of the areas he controlled i mean i think i have a great love for southern jewish culture which has its own strain very different than new york jewish culture yeah i was gonna say people people always assume that i have like uh uh yiddishite and uh and new york culture roots and i'm like only because I affect them, like because that's what people think. There, uh, there are Jews Jewish are. cookbooks from the South, from you know a hundred years ago that mention cooking pork, and you're like, what? And they're like, yeah, we're in the South. We're not going to survive without pork. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like right? Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's also like if you go into any synagogue in the South designed before the 20th century, they're designed to look a lot like churches. Yeah, like yeah. without, they don't have any any images in them, but, but it, it, I was about to say the, the, the let's, let's just not be noticed here was huge. And, in, in Southern Jewish culture and Southern Jewish culture is actually interestingly really supported for progressive reasons on Olothar's part, but for really bad reasons on, uh, on the British crown part. Cause they got all these Sephardi that came over after the Spanish expulsion. And when they finally relaxed their anti-Jewish rules and then they're like, well, you know, uh, maybe we can get rid of them by sending them as a buffer with the with these Protestants against the Catholics in in Georgia, um, which is well, why. And you also have Leo Frank, and you know, I mean, yeah. Jews were lynched in the South, you know, all the time. Yeah, and Italians. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's uh, it's it's one of these things where, like, I have a very like. One, you know, my heritage isn't just Jewish, but but yeah. two, like I am vaguely 
white ethnic and how that was interpreted when I, even as late as the eighties, when I was a kid is everyone assumed that I was just really pale mixed. And it still <laughs> actually is the joke that I, as I look like Sean King and in black circles and with black friends, this is brought up a lot. And it's like, well, it's funny because I feel like this, this to me reminds me of like the assumption that anybody who was white and swarthy that they couldn't say for sure was Latin was assumed to be, uh, you know, um, a word I won't say on air because um, it's now, ra- well, it's always been racist, but it's now known to be racist. But when I was a kid, it was not, it was not unheard to hear it. It's a, it's a, it's a Q word. Um and for people who don't know, look it up. But um, but that's interesting to me. And I think that, that's part of the problem of American socialist culture is that it is kind of limited to a few groups. Um, and that's the first wave of German immigrants, the Italian immigrants. Um, and then you do have it in the miners and Appalachian Scotch Irish, but it's in specific um, areas. So in upper Appalachia during the coal mine wars uh, in, and then uh, following the industrial route, but it doesn't really break out. There's also a rich black communist culture going yeah, on. Yeah. In the back. I mean, Harry Haywood, Claudia Jones. You, I mean, you also I was about to get to that, but yeah. Hammer it's... and Ho, you know, yeah, I was well. The thing is, is the CPUSA. One of the things that it really that worked out really well for it, um, as far as establishing enrolls to the black community, and then when the Popular Front is established, the black community uses it to affect the Democratic Party to be, uh, for good and ill. I think ultimately it's mm-hmm. been bad, yeah. but um, so you have this period of independence, which is a disaster in Europe. But the United States meant that like black uh, workers learned to trust uh, a lot of the communist worker uh, communist movements and the communist organizers because they weren't associated with the Democratic Party, unlike the populists who had folded in before them into the Democratic Party. And so they trusted them more not to be like crypto neo Confederates. Um and then you had stuff like Haywood and the promotion of the Black Belt thesis. Although, interestingly, in the research I've been reading lately, actually indicates the Black Belt thesis really wasn't even that popular amongst Black communists outside of the leadership. Yeah. But um, it did establish that history. And then that flips on itself in the 60s, where there's a whole lot of the CP USA, even though it's, you know, splintering, dying off. This is the great... This is the great hemorrhaging of the CPUSA between uh, 56 and 70. Yeah. Um, but it has a lot of like, it's been funding all the black arts programs and stuff that like have kept a lot of the civil rights leaders relatively protected. Right. And that's, and that's something that's, that again has been kind of written out of history, except when you keep on reading. And as I studied, you know, I'm from the South. I studied African-American literature because that's like half sure. our literature. Um and you're like, wait, every one of these guys are ex-communist. Like, well, except, I mean, did you ever read Zora Neale Hurston? Oh, yeah, history? I did read. Yeah, Zora, that's the ex- Zora Neale Hurston and Ralph Ellison are the exceptions, actually. Yeah, yeah. Zora Neale Hurston's weird. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like her politics are, are like when I tell people, like, yeah, she was kind of, she was pro-black culture, but she didn't. She was an anti-integrationist, but not for the reasons that that you might think of like self hate or anything. She, she, she hated the communists. Yeah. Oh yeah. She did. Um, um, and by the time you get to people like Alice Walker, that tradition's gone. Mm -hmm. But like, when you look at like Baldwin, white, uh, uh, Lorraine Hansberry, you're just like, all of them did some of their time in uh, the CPUSA. I mean, like the Jews, it's like, I'm especially Yiddish, but though it, extends beyond it part of the bargain of assimilation combined with red scare was like ixnay on the communist k stuff you know like a lot of people, irving howe all of these people who had been very much in the party had to plead to white christian america why they weren't communists and should be accepted and and they did it you yeah, know they joined the I mean, congress for cultural freedom and then this, 
you know, I have a theory, although it's complicated by the fact that every one of these people that I mentioned has a tie to the OSS or the CIA on both mm -hmm. sides, mm -hmm. but that the, the the Harry Cruz revival of cultural natural uh, nationalism came from the fact that so many former communists in the CPUSA uh, during the Red Scare um, gave up their Yiddishite um commitments and the commitments to to socialism for like socialist zionism mm -hmm. and left-wing zionism which then made it look like this to a lot of uh black leaders and harry cruz does this explicitly to the point where this book is often unfortunately discussed in the context of black anti-semitism um which i think is a little unfair mm -hmm. um but and, and the problems of the Negro intellectual, he, he, he just like, we have to break off from the communist party to develop our own cultural nationalism to have our own culture. And that doesn't go well for anybody historically. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, it's an interesting thing to see because I think part of that is this capitulation to Zionism and this like, as, as a like, okay, fine, we can't make it work. We either have to fully assimilate or, or we have to, uh, we no longer see our interest in the broad proletariat, which also interestingly means that we that we either double down on uniqueness or we are we try to join just general American culture in a kind of bourgeois way. Yeah. And, and I'm seeing, you know, I'm I'm old enough that synagogue had no interest for me when I was a younger man. It was only when I got older that I got into it. Um, and part of it was because the assimilationist trend was so – what they wanted to be was the most boring possible Protestants in their vision of what a boring Protestant would be. And so a lot of synagogues became so bone-dry boring that really the only thing holding people together was a love of the state of Israel and some sense that they were clinging to tradition. And – by the late 60s, there was a backlash to it. There was, you know, everyone knows the whole earth catalog. There was a very influential set of catalogs called the Jewish catalog that were using the whole earth catalog to reform Judaism. And what came out of it was the Jewish renewal movement, a big growth in uh, reconstructionist Judaism, and some other really, really good trends we're, you know, in the, when you get to the hippies and they were, you know, Jewish kids were running off to India to join ashrams and, you know, not knowing that there is a very long and ancient tradition of meditation in Judaism. Yeah. Um, unfortunately though, the, the outside of like, okay, we're getting really into Jew stuff. This is not, sorry, sorry, I apologize. but, um, but Outside of Jewish renewal and like Zelman and whatnot, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the 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 some of the people who really represent um, like Jewish meditation uh, are people like Arya Kaplan, but Arya Kaplan's like a Haradim, so it's and Sephardic, yeah, yeah. But you know, but but it, it it's he he's associated with like fairly ultra orthodoxy, um, and and. What I think it's been a disaster. I mean, in in some ways, if, but if those you're, barriers it, are less are more porous than you think. Well, fair. Um, I think when, before the Hasidim got into uh, <laughs> got into basically being Zionist anti Zionist, which is what most of them are now. Um, uh, oh, Meshuggah. Yeah, um, that was a, a pretty good th that was a good area. Now we have to deal with renewal and reconstruction, which is which is interesting. I am a child of basically uh, a, a crypto Jew who who has been every religion on the planet, but I actually was raised more Buddhist, and that's what I kind of understand the world in. Yeah, yeah. and I have uh, under tried to understand my ethnic heritage both. Uh, Jewish, Scottish, and Slavic, mm -hmm. um, uh, and Sephardic, Jewish, Scottish, and Slavic, more uh, in the last, as I get older, similar to you, uh, also as a way of breaking up this idea of like 
over identifying with this generic project of whiteness. Yeah. Which, um, which I understand the impulse in the settler societies to do. I understand why it was constructed. It was to, you know, to, it wasn't a sim, like it's, it's assimilationism, but for everybody, um, as long as you're not black. Yeah. Um, I'm, and, I'm very influenced by, uh, there's, I'm not a fan of this novelist, but I'm influenced by one idea of his, which uh, the, the novelist Tom Stopper, had this book uh, still life with woodpecker. And at one point he's talking about people craving an esoteric tradition and craving meditation and some connection to the divine. And he says, the best way you're going to find it is through the traditions of your people, not for any kind of like cosmic racist union kind of way, but just because you're going to have more inroads if it's your people doing it, you're going to have more connections to the spiritual path of your people because they're your people. And that therefore, rather than look outside your people's tradition, try and find the esoteric tradition with your people. And he was talking about the Irish and Celtic, uh, occultism, but it struck me because what I've found is when I explore Jewish esotericism, it just feels incredibly natural to me, you know, feels like it was there all along. Mm. Well, um, I think it's interesting. Uh, one of the things that has come up a lot on my show unexpectedly is that almost everyone that I take on who has a mathematical uh, background tends to be more sympathetic to religion than everybody else. It's a, um, you know, the, 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 it's a nasty pitfall of mathematics is Neoplatonism. Like, yep. Very hard to get away from. You know? uh, it, it, believe me, I try. Um, like my, my esoteric tradition within Judaism is of rationalists and logicians who were also esoteric. So mm. that's something that baffles most Christians when I tell them. But there is a very deep tradition of hardcore rationalist, logician, esotericists in Judaism that goes back past Maimonides all the way to the Talmud. Yeah, there's, there's a tradition of that. What's funny about that with Christians, though, there's a tradition of that in Protestant Christianity. Sure. Uh, there, it's just the pietism movement somehow severed that entirely mm. from their own history like it's it's uh like a christian kabbalist and and uh, like newton um yeah. uh i i think you know there's a lot in freemasonry too so yeah yeah um however see this is a part of the conversation most of the conversations we make uh, religious people feel uncomfortable. This is a part of the conversation that's going to make the communists feel very uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, because uh, like <laughs> most American atheists, just by number, are culturally Christian. Oh yeah, hundred. And they're just not willing to confront the fact that most of their assumptions about religion are assumptions about Christianity that just are not relevant in other religions and not even accurate. Like, you know, in my synagogue, there are atheists who are praying, and you're like, well why and they will give you very intelligent reasons why they're atheists and why they're praying and that doesn't make sense to the kind of debate me atheists that i run into yeah no i got into this in anthropology into deep history when i was talking about ancient greeks and i'm like look if you consider dharmic religions religions and almost all of you do then you have to consider neoplatonism all the socratic movements epicureanism even Sereniacism, as we mentioned earlier, they're also religions by that definition. They're yeah. not like Christianity at all. Um, One but, of the sacred names of God is Ain, which means nothing. Right. It's just, it's just, um, well, and I talk about this when I talk about Stoicism. I'm like, one of the reasons why people don't get modern Stoicism is because it's reduced to an ethical movement, but it had both a metaphysics, a physics, and a theological commitment that historically is attached to it yeah um it's a commitment to the unity of of beings it's a commitment to weird shit like the materialism of god 
Mm -hmm. uh, which is that, that, you know, like, no, like they thought gods were a everything and be material. Like the, yeah, that, yeah. like, like, uh, the, you know, that they talk about Zeus in ways of, of like, like the universe is Zeus's body. Um, and stuff like that. Yeah, and look, that's I, all I, I stripped have, out of that in, in modern discussions and ways it makes it not make sense. I right? have no conflict between religious Judaism and Marxism, mm -hmm. which baffles a lot of people. But no, these things are coherent. Like, um, I understand the Jewish religion well enough to plant myself within it. And I am a Marxist. And those things are perfectly naturally working together in my belief system. Yeah. Although now some, some anti-communist, anti-Semite feels vindicated. Oh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> like, we knew it was the Talbot the whole time. No. Um, no, no, it really isn't. Um, but I, I do, I do think it's, this is one thing I'm going to say, I'm going to preface this for people. I think, people ask me what my metaphysics are all the time. And I'm like, I'm just not answering you. No. Um, like you like, don't have to give people an answer, Derek. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's just, I'm not going to tell you only deserve an answer if they deserve an answer. Right. Um, but the, the, what, what I say is I approach our problems by what I like consider structural functional materialism, which yeah. is I act as if the universe is monistically one thing. I do not know that I actually think that it is, but since we have different commitments um, that I have to process things that way, I actually do think like these questions matter um, because they matter for uh, your operating principles and your operating principles are how you're going to design around your constraints. They do matter. I mean, I like to give David Graeber a lot of shit <laughs> um, because David Graeber does, I think too much with the belief end of this mm -hmm. and, and not playing up how much this actually affects literally how you structure things like logistics and, 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 and surplus relations. And he seems to think the mental model really matters. And I'm like, yeah, I think sometimes the what you do in the logistics comes comes first and then the mental model happens. Yeah. But regardless of the order of operations, there is a truth that the intersection of your principles and how you design your material world around that, both socially and literally physically, really is how you're going to organize your society. Yeah. And, um, and we get back to Stafford's idea that you're at a different level of recursion when you're organizing yourself and your family, but you're using that recursive tree to climb all the way up to the planet, the solar system, the universe, you know? Right. So you're, you're in, you know, as and Stafford also was a mystic. He studied Tantra and was very, very interested in yoga and taught yoga for most of his life. He was a, he was a dirty hippie. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, like he was a dirty hippie, quasi communist. Who, yeah. uh, but was what did very important work. I mean, and yeah. and it's he also a, wrote a book on capital mm -hmm. called Status Quo, which I would love to find. No one seems to know where the only existing copies are. That's interesting that he that, that that's so hard to find. Yeah, I, it's not. Yeah, it's not surprising that it's hard to find. Well, I, it's like finding the original version of Norma uh, Wiener's Human Use of Human Beings, which you can find, but that's where like all the Soviet stuff is clear, yeah, as yeah. opposed to the second draft, where that's all like really, really, really played down. Because um, he got a knock on the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he did. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and so I, I think people, you know, we talk about this Cold War mind. Yeah. You, there's a whole lot that I, that's been obscured by the Cold War in a lot of diff. There's a lot of black history. There's a lot of Southern yeah. history. There's a whole lot. That's just we have to lost. get the Cold War out of our heads. It's imprisoning us. It's keeping us from organizing. It's keeping us from thinking about our own reality. We have to expunge the Cold War mentality from our heads. It's so imperative. It, it, what what is what is worrisome to me is when people start to do that they just invert it so they just like try to it's not easy a conspiracy theory view but with the soviet union as the good guy and i'm like no it's that's not really 
the history doesn't back that up either. Like you, no. you don't, you don't fix a bad worldview by just inverting it. Like it's a cheap shot, right? But but I get it. I get the I natural get inclination to it when you feel like. I mean, one of the things that I have been learning is like, while yes, uh, American atrocityism produced a lot of academics and produced people all over the map. Um, it's been over focused on in, in American communist scholarship, partly because it produced so many academics, but partly also because it didn't get censored as much yeah. uh, by um, powers that be in the United States. Um, and similar, similarly with Maoism, which was just seen as so far in that, like, they didn't know what to do with it. Um, whereas actually understanding the history of the Populist Party, the the the, the Socialist Party of the USA, and the early Communist Party as something beyond just an adjunct to the common turn in 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 Russia, and in the USSR, let me be particular, um, has been really hard to do, um, and. There's a lot of tension there because there are times where, yes, actually the, the CPUSA's leadership really is just acting off of uh, the USR. And there are times where it like has nothing to do with it whatsoever. And it's just kind of appropriating um, language from that's like a common term language, but not like William Z. Foster's wild, for example, because he's like, I'm like, yeah, you have stuff like in America, like. You know, Marxist Leninist syndicalist <laughs> and stuff like like that. They never should have centered the common turn in the USSR. It never should have been. It should have been sat at a higher level of recursion than the USSR. Of course, Stalin would never have tolerated that. But like for it to have worked, it needed to sit atop every country and not get sucked into identifying with one. Right. This is one of the things that I actually uh, sided with Bordiga on. I'm not a Bordiga. The more I read about yeah. Bordigaism, and the more I'm kind of like, nope. But his I point love the Italian communists so much. I have my. I love them so much. But I had I do a crazy dance through Italian communism that's not coherent. I don't even pretend it is. You know. Well, it, it's funny because. But, but anyway, my point with, with <laughs> Bordiga, who, who won, even though a lot of Bordigists are not, he was actually highly sympathetic to national revolutions. And two, um, uh, he, 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 there's a quote about Stalin being the gravedigger of revolution that is often misattributed to Trotsky, even by Stalinists. Mm -hmm. It was actually by Bordiga, and he said it at the Kermontan, and his point was, what you're saying yeah. he was saying that like no like if you're gonna talk about national autonomy and all of us being equal no nation should have determining vote in the common turn we should all be represented by our parties equally here and he stood up to stalin and left yeah i mean like the chinese revolution when oh, China became a communist country, why didn't it not join the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics? Right. Because that wasn't a real international body. Right. And that leads to China being pulled into the American orbit and the, and the, and the Sino-Soviet split being a fucking disaster for the yeah, world. I mean, Every so, every communist country should have been part of the USSR if the USSR was truly international. Right. And and also every like every party should have had an equal representation at the common turn, uh, like not, um, yeah. not just as junior brother. I mean, yeah, uh, that seems as an operational principle too. It seems pretty obvious, but um, it's it's one of these things when you when you get re re recursion. I mean, th this is the problem though, and I've talked I've talked with Kyle about this is because of Lenin and Engels being obsessed with the with the Prussian military high command as the peak of efficiency mm -hmm. that's been the model and and I pointed out to someone whenever they talk about that kind of efficiency I'm like the US is not organized like that that way and it's more efficient like yeah. Yeah. um centralization is not the only vector to which efficiency is determined and that's another thing that you learn from cybernetic theory. Um, 
like the, and there's also a sense in which if you have an overly efficient system that has a single bottleneck uh you just have cascade fail failure when it breaks with <coughs> soviet union yeah, yeah um but i and, mean like i mean going back to stafford stafford's solution to the gremio strike in 73 was brilliant it was you know have all of the trucking networked in such a way that when the gremio strike you can just move around it uh, this is also funny um so I pointed out to people whenever they're like, uh, you know, truckers are striking. Those are the workers. I'm like, one, okay, we can argue about whether how much percentage of truckers are petite bourgeois or whatever. Uh, but two, trucking is has a tendency to be a more solipsistic field. I'm going to use it instead of reactionary. Yeah. Um, because you work alone. That's what the Gremios were. Right. They like, were petty bourgeois. Right. But like, they're either petty bourgeois, even when they're workers, they work alone. That socialization is actually really important, yeah, which yeah. is why you can't take trucker strikes as a proxy for what the entirety of a class thinks. Yeah. Um, it is a section of the class that has its own interest, and it has interests that are different. Like, I actually will say this, during COVID, trucking being not as worried about COVID restrictions, it actually logically makes sense. They don't interact with a lot of people. Exactly. Like... But they could open a lot of vectors up that without thinking about it. Like I get it, I get the problems, and I, I even I even have sympathy with what the truckers were complaining about. Actually, that's not my point. My point is like you can't take any part of the class that has a very specific set of incentives itself from the structure of its job and take it and extrapolate to that the entirety of the class i think you know i think people love studying the Revol russian revolution it's a running joke among leftists at what point would the bolsheviks have shot you to find your politics yeah. you know but i think people would do well to study 1905 because there were even though it failed there were really smart things in 1905 that they used again and succeeded but like you know, the fact that it's where they figured out that the print setters for the newspapers were communists and well, were socialists are, you know, at the time and therefore didn't have to print anything the czar wanted them to. And the railway workers figured out on the fly that if there was train loads of of soldiers putting down a strike they didn't have to make the trains run and i think that's the thing that we need today so badly is to realize if your job is oppressing your own people or other people you are in solidarity with you don't have to do it like i mean i was looking at the florida um situation where desantis has declared that all books in classrooms need to get out until a right-wing library association has a certification based on focus on the family has created or moms for liberty. And, and until then they have to get all their books out of the classroom until they can be approved by the goon squad. And all of these principals and teachers are like crying and taking their books out of the classroom. What if they didn't? I mean, they are facing felonies, but they can't arrest every single teacher in Florida. What if they all stood up and said, no, it stops here. We're all in solidarity. We we stop this now. So here's what I want to push back on you. Okay. You have enough. to beat up some reactionary teachers. Yeah. Yeah. And that's fine. There's a minority of collaborators in almost every school. Sure. Like, um, no, I mean, I, I, I'm just telling you why, why they feel so like... I deal in a teachers union and I'm all, and, and weirdly because of the structure of dues in the teachers union, the rural and more conservative unions are actually overrepresented because their local dues are so low. Mm. Um, whereas urban districts have a dramatic underrepresented because their dues are actually quite higher, um, which is very frustrating to me because there's actually no real reason for it because our, our union, like most unions is actually well invested in land and doesn't really anyway. <laughs> um, but, but beyond that, uh, we have about a 40% mi uh, minority that can just shut down anything we do. Mm -hmm. Like, um, 
And that's why. Yeah. And um, that's that has been the 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 kind of evil genius of cultural politics is because cultural politics seems to obscure uh, material interests so profoundly. Um, and when you don't think your material interests are going to change much anyway, cultural politics has a lot of attractiveness to it because at least you can protect parts of your ways of life by through defensive means and cultural, whatever, whatever. Yeah. And I, I really do think systemically socialists cannot play on that field, even though it seems like liberals and thus left liberals won the quote culture war. And in a lot of ways they did, they, what they don't realize about that is abstentionism on culture war issues is the thing that prevents other issues from happening. And I'm not saying we have to, like, I am actually not talking about throwing, you know, trans people under the bus or anything like that. I'm saying, I, I am saying explicitly when we talk about cultural issues to defend people, we need to talk about it in, in ways that, that deliberately build um, empathy and solidarity and are not, not protect us because we're a beleaguered victim. Yeah. I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding and it's a liberal conception of rights that we have rights to protect victims. No, we, we have bodily autonomy because everyone wants bodily autonomy. Like that's what we should be fighting for. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, yeah, there's, we, a, there's mm -hmm. an amazing, uh, you know, Bill Bailey is an old communist who it, Started out as a communist uh, longshoreman and ended up becoming a movie actor. Mm -hmm. He tells a story, though. He tells a story about um, going to a newsreel in the late '30s in the movies and seeing a Nazi soldier drag an old Jewish woman by the hair down the street. And he said, "My blood just began to boil, and I got madder and madder and madder because I thought, what if that was my mother?" And like, similarly, you know, growing up in 70s and 80s USA, by default, you were homophobic. By default, you were transphobic. And I remember the first trans friend I ever had getting yelled at on the street by transphobes, and my blood just began to boil. And it took her stopping me not to throw haymakers at somebody, you know, because once you know, once you feel that bond of sympathy, then everything changes, you know? Right. I think, yeah, I, I agree with that. I just think we, the, the bond of sympathy needs to be based off of true mutual interest, yeah. not just fear of victimization true. and, and the victimization, because, because that'll move you and me, but that doesn't move everybody. Yeah. No. And yeah, there's gonna be some there's gonna be some bigot, bigots you're never going to move. I'm actually you know, yeah. but when I also when you also remind people like, hey, these rights affect other things. No. Um like that's where you get to people. I will admit on this that where this gets murky and breaks down in popular opinion is around children, but mm -hmm if you want people to respond positively to trans issues, frame it in bodily autonomy terms, and they will almost always um, respond positively. You'll get like 70, 80% support. Whereas if you frame it in victimhood terms, you think you still get majority support actually, but it's, it's not nearly as high. And we are trained by liberal and academic institutions who, who think that you know victimhood is should be adjusted for in this meritocratic sense mm -hmm. that um, because oh we have to we have to be meritocratic so we have to adjust for the like that is a an academic assumption sure. um, that we had kind of let program the way we think about society I just don't think most people are that way another thing for example when you go to workers and you talk to workers you don't talk about how they're losing like. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not something that most people, particularly if you're not one of them, like, yeah, you could, if, if you're having a one-to-one -one conversation with somebody, you can, you, you can say, okay, you're getting your ass kicked. We, we understand that. And you can be honest about it. But if I come in and I'm not from your sector and I'm not properly speaking your peer, 
I yeah. better not be saying, well, we're coming to help you because you're getting your ass kicked because that's going to yeah. alienate us immediately. Absolutely. I'm just going to elicit rage. Right. And it does. Like, and it does. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, I think, you know, we've seen the repopularization of unions. Now, I have, I've been talking a lot now about how, like, some of that's a myth. Sure. Um, uh, the, the, the repopularization has actually, in, has actually equaled any kind of large scale reinvestment in the unions. Um, and I actually think there's structural problems with unions as part of why. But all that said, um, I can tell you, like, if you go back and talk to people from the 70s and 80s when they started feeling like, uh, unions were no longer representing them and union opinion dropped precipitously. A lot of it was talking to people like they're victims and a lot of it was union leadership was seen as outsiders. Yeah. yeah. And that those are the two things that are utterly corrosive to uh, solidarity. And unfortunately, I, I do think those principles to come back to principles again are driving a lot of our bad decision making um, because we have principles that we don't even realize that we have because because everybody can call everyone else a liberal because in our society it's like it's like calling anyone who's not an explicitly from another religious background a Christian in some ways it's actually true like those are your principled norms whether you realize it or not yeah that's part of your interpretive rubric of the world um, and. You know, this is why I always used to, even when I was part, I've done things in the skeptic movement, maybe you've seen it, but I, I used to always like, even like point out like the problem with, with uh, Richard Dawkins is not that he's an atheist. It's that he's an Anglican prig who just happens to not believe in God. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, like, and people were very confused by that. I'm like, no, his cultural norms are, are, are very conservative, liberal Anglicanism. And as he got older, it really showed. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it's it was there in the way he talked the entire time. And I'm like, one of the problems with that kind of view of atheism is, is it thinks that you can move beyond your cultural context just because you changed nominal beliefs. But yeah. your beliefs are reinforced in other ways. You know, so much of what a person does is unconscious and so much of it is unexamined and so much of it is submerged that if all you do is change your mentality, your talking self, you have not changed very much about yourself. Totally. That's that's absolutely true. You just um, put on a new suit of clothes. Well, you know, this has been a much wider ranging conversation, but it's covered a lot of awesome things. We're going to have you back on and we'll maybe talk about the relevance of the history of Freemasonry to socialism sometime in a couple of months. Absolutely, Derek. This has been a blast. All right. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Have hey, a great thanks day. Thanks a lot. Yeah.